Hey RV family, keep it, I keep it tight. My name is Jay Morris, the RV guy, and I'm back again to bring you another video. Welcome back to my monthly series, Albums I Liked, my general catch-up series for the albums that I liked in the previous month. Got a few records that I have not reviewed yet that are on this list, so there are some new records I'm going to talk about in brief excerpts here. Wasn't the most jam-packed month, but there were still a number of pretty good records. Go ahead and let me know in the comment section below what your favorite records from the past month is, and let's get right into it. The reviews for all these records are going to be down in the description box below. Go watch them because I can't give these records as much justice as I would do in those reviews. And if I do end up reviewing the albums and not on this list, I will add those in later. <laughs> Got a few records here that weren't 8 out of 10s, but I do think are very much worth your time. Records that were close to that, the first of which being the Lotus Thief record, Oresteia, a very interesting post-black metal record, fronted by Bezalith, who has worked with the black metal project Botanist. Simultaneously, it cycles through a rigid and a clean sound. This is a record that I stumbled upon, and I'm very glad I did. As I said in my review, they kind of flawlessly go between different sections, flawlessly going between black metal sections, these post-black metal sections. There's ambient music thrown into the mix and progressive music thrown into the mix with a variety of different vocal styles that range from head voice to chest voice to black metal shrieks. Next up is the Glass Tides record in between. If you enjoy the hyper melodic stylings of Dreambound, the Dreambound YouTube channel that is constantly just pumping out so many different promotions. They do an amazing job of putting bands on people's radar such as myself. It's an album that I basically call melodic metalcore but without the absolute heaviest and finality of the kill switch engager and as I lay dying it is a lot more soft a lot more low-key but still with some great riffage and drum work even if in the grand scheme of things I think the vocals aren't necessarily the most descript it's still a really catchy and hard-hitting record Eminem music to be murdered by love this a lot more than I enjoyed kamikaze and especially revival I do think that this is a very good step in the right direction he starts to understand why people enjoyed his music in the first place tracks like darkness take on that dark under Undertone. He's bringing on new artists such as Young M.A. and obviously the late Juice World, which instantly gives off the impression that he's not as bitter as he's been recently. So for the people that like old snappy Eminem with the fast raps, check this out. Although by now I feel like most people have heard this record. It's not my favorite Eminem record, but it is my favorite Eminem record to come out in a hot minute, and that's a good thing. Because to be frank, I feel like Eminem's kind of been batting zero for a little bit. All right, into my favorite records. Number one is David Keenan's record, A Beginner's Guide to Bravery. David Keenan, this is his first studio-length album. He is an up-and-coming Irish singer-songwriter. He has so much of the passion and so much of the charisma that I think a lot of contemporary folk music is really bypassing nowadays and really forgetting. It feels genuine. It feels vulnerable. It feels impassioned. It feels inspirited. It feels like he's believing every single word he's talking about. I love the inflections in his voice. I love his timbre, how he cracks, how he whimpers and whines about these stories that feel not only really reminiscent, but also so positive and uplifting in the grand scheme of just talking about life and talking about just different stories that he grew up with and different factors of his life that he really films through a relatable lens. One that is very laser focused on the human spirit. Rafik Batia with Standards Volume 1. It's hard to explain this record or why I enjoy it so much. It is an EP. It's only four tracks long. It's an experimental ambient album. That's the best way I can explain it. It has such an ethereal sound to it. It's so glistening. It's so floating in some ethosphere that is just, just barely out of reach. It's the musical equivalent of seeing two galaxies about to collide with each other like a star combusting. It's basically stardust in the musical form. I don't really need to remind you guys that I really enjoyed the poppy record. I disagree. I know I got a little bit of backlash for this because not everyone likes Poppy. Not every metalhead likes Poppy. She came from a non-metal point of view, but her music had always had somewhat of a new metal and a metalcore feel. But with her split with Titanic Sinclair and her signing to Sumerian Records, she has pushed herself into a different direction that I'm so excited for. Pretty much all of these tracks slap in a different way way, even if it's not a way that I'm necessarily that big of a fan of. It's just the experimentation. It's the left field approach to merging things like new metal and metalcore and this glitzy Japanese pop type music. And I just hope to hear more from her that sounds like this in the future or her just pushing her style into even newer directions. Next up is the Mac Miller record, Circles. This is his first and I hope 
only posthumous album. It was being worked on, prior to his death that is, it was being worked on, and then John Bryan came on, picked up the pieces, and just ran to the finish line with it. It is the best thing that I think any Mac Miller fan could have asked for. I'm not even that big of a fan of Mac Miller, but this record touched me in a way that is different than any Mac Miller record has done before, and I think that comes from something similar to the Purple Mountains record that released last year, where you kind of have to not so much take it as a grain of salt anymore, not take it as just lyricism, which you should never take a musician's lyricism as just nothingness. Obviously, you should take it case by case, but a lot of times artists put things into their music to try to be a far cry, and I think that's what Mac Miller was doing to some degree. Either that or he was giving you his story, giving you his feelings, giving you his depression, giving you his anxieties, and it's so, it's seen in such a different context now that Mac Miller's gone, and hearing these tracks now are not only forlorn and unforgettable, but haunting to say the least. I have Lorna Shore with Immortal. We get it. CJ is not a good person. The record would have not been the same without CJ. This isn't the most ingenious deathcore release. I believe I said that in my review. But how focused is this thing? Holy crap is this thing focused and forceful and relentless from start to finish? Can we talk about the breakdowns? Can we talk about the production? We can talk about all of this. CJ's vocal performance, the guitar work, the gritty bass work, how punchy these drums are. It's sincerely one of the most hard-hitting deathcore releases that I've seen in a while, and that's her trajectory that Lorna Shore's been on for a while. And I hope that's what's going on with CJ doesn't break the band. Please, don't break the band. Get a vocalist that is capable. Give a vocalist that can do good by the band and keep making music because Lorna Shore is just at a peak right now for deathcore that we really desperately need. And stay for the end screen. I'll link some videos that you might be interested in. Obviously, what are your favorite records from the previous month? I would love to know. Like this video if you enjoyed it. Subscribe to join the review family today and smash that notification bell to be notified of my future uploads. You know who it is. My name is Jamie Lister, and I'm signing off for the first